to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. What must I do to be saved? This is the question that we're going to be looking at as we study the marvelous book of Acts. We hope you'll get your Bible and stay tuned as we're going to let God's Word answer this marvelous question for us. Welcome to the Gospel of Christ program. My name is Ben Bailey, and we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. Those members of the Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship assembly. If you've got a Bible question or there's something you'd like to study, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God together with you. Also, at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. You can log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and all our Bible study material is free of charge and available to you. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, whether on DVD or CD, we'd love to send that to you. You can fill out a media request form from our website, or you can call us toll-free at one 855 Four five eight three nine zero five. On our website, we have a host of Bible study material, including transcripts, study question, question and answers, and a variety of study materials that would help you in your study of the Word of God. Friend, at the Gospel of Christ, we're concerned about the salvation of souls. That's our main emphasis. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about hidden agendas. We just simply want to help men and women know the Word of God and to go to heaven. And so as we transition to our study today, we hope that you'll get your Bible out and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God together. The book of Acts is a very powerful, action-packed book in which the great question, what must I do to be saved, is answered. As we think about the New Testament as a whole, it's broken down into four unique categories. We first have Matthew through Luke, or Matthew through John, the Gospel accounts, which tell us about the life of Christ. They tell us about the birth, the, the early days of Jesus. We learn about His ministry and His teaching. We learn ultimately about His death, His sacrifice, and His resurrection. And so that first category, Matthew through John, is about the life and the death and the resurrection of Christ. Then that second category, where we are looking at today, is the book of Acts. Now that we've learned about Christ, what He did, and His sacrifice, the book of Acts is uniquely placed to answer the great question, What must I do to be saved? Now, we mentioned the other two categories as well. Romans through Jude tell us now that you are a Christian, how do I live faithfully to Jesus? And then that final stanza or category, the book of Revelation, tells one how to die victoriously in Christ. As we think about living messages of the New Testament and specifically the book of Acts today, let's realize that the Bible is a book of living messages. The book of Acts is a book that applies directly to man's greatest need today, salvation. And God tells us the Bible is a living book. Hebrews 4 verse 12, the scripture says this, The word of God is living. It's alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so when we think about the Word of God, as we study these messages, these are alive, these are relevant, these are practical messages that we can definitely apply to our lives today. Now, the book of Acts 
You know, a lot of people run to look to different places in the New Testament for salvation. But friend, the book of Acts, it's the book in the New Testament that gives us real life examples of what people did to become a Christian. That's the whole theme of Acts. Acts chapter 2, what did they do on Pentecost to become Christians? Acts chapter 3, as Peter is preaching in Solomon's portico, what did they do there? You've got the Ethiopian eunuch, you've got Saul of Tarsus, you've got Lydia and her house. And over and over again, that's what Acts is all about, answering these great questions. Acts 2 verse 37, they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? Acts chapter 9 verses 4 through 6, Saul of Tarsus said, Lord, what would you have me to do? And then, of course, that great question, the greatest question of all, Acts 16 verse 30, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, as we think about the book of Acts, let's also realize the book of Acts, and especially a key verse, Acts chapter 2, verse 36, is likely the key verse of the whole Bible. Listen to Acts 2, verse 36. Peter, as he brings his sermon on Pentecost to a climax, says this, Therefore, since the prophets spoke about it, since God has approved it, since even David himself spoke about it, therefore... Let all the house of Israel know assuredly God has made this Jesus, the one you crucified, Lord and Christ. Now, this is such a pivotal verse and for this reason. Everything prior to Acts 2 verse 36 is looking forward to it, is shouting it out, is pointing toward it, is prophesying about it. And everything after Acts 2 verse 36 is predicated on the fact that yes, Jesus, this Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Lord, He's the Messiah, and we must submit to Him and obey the teaching found in Scripture. Book of Acts, we want to mention, has really, we could uh, kind of qu- categorize it as having three major purposes. Now, we've mentioned the first and the foremost, and that is Acts gives us real life examples of conversion. When people want to know how to be saved, Acts is the book that tells us that. It does have two other purposes that are very unique, though. Acts also tells us about the establishment of the Lord's church. Do you remember in 2 Samuel 7, verse 14 following, or verses 12 through 14, God promised to David that someone from his seed would reign over the kingdom of Israel or kingdom, and that kingdom would be an everlasting or eternal kingdom. We learn then in Daniel 2, verse 44, that that eternal kingdom is going to be set up and prophesied to be set up in one of the four periods that are mentioned. The Roman period is that period. And we learn in Acts 2, as Jesus promised, Matthew 16, verse 18, I will build my church. We open to Acts chapter 2, verse 47. And for the very first time, after men and women have obeyed the gospel, it's the first time it's been preached, first time repentance and remission of sins is found in Jesus. The Bible says this, to those who gladly received His word and obeyed it, the Lord added to the church daily. Those who are being saved. And so Acts not only gives us examples of conversion, Acts tells us about the establishment of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then a, a third purpose that is often overlooked about Acts is this. Acts serves as a history book for the rest of the New Testament. Now, we read about we read the book of First and Second Corinthians. Where do I learn about that at? If I want to study First Corinthians, I first want to read Acts 18 and learn what happened. If I want to read the book of Ephesians, I want to open to Acts 19 to the establishment of the Lord's church there. If I want to read about the, the book of Philippians, I want to open to Acts 16 and, and learn about what happened there. It's a history book for the rest of the New Testament. Before I open any letter and read it, whether it be Colossians, whether it be First and Second Thessalonians, Thessalonians, I want to read in the book of Acts where the church began there, what kind of problems, struggles they were dealing with, and what was it that got it started there, and maybe who are some of the people that might be mentioned. So it also serves as a history book of the New Testament. Let's then turn our attention to the first four chapters in the book of Acts. We begin with Acts chapter 1. We now have the disciples of Jesus after he has 
died. He's there with his disciples. He's been resurrected. And they quiz Jesus by saying, Lord, are you now going to uh, establish, return the kingdom to Israel? Are you going to make it like it was during David's reign? And Jesus says, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons, but here's what I want you to do. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. They're still looking for a physical kingdom. And so they want to know, Jesus, are you going to restore that kingdom now? And Jesus said, that's not what you need to worry about. Here's your concern. I want you to be my witnesses. I want you to preach the gospel throughout the world. Friend, as we think about their mission, and as we think about what God has commissioned us to do today, let's realize a powerful message in the opening verses of Acts chapter 1 is, just like the disciples then, we need to be busy spreading the message of the gospel. The Bible says in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, Jesus speaking, Go into all the world. Preach the gospel unto every creature. God will take care of the things He needs to take care of. He's more than capable of doing that. Let's let God worry about those matters. You know, sometimes we get so caught up, like the disciples, in other things. The political climate, the social climate, the, the moral climate. And we get so bogged down in that that we fail to realize our mission is to preach the gospel. Him we preach warning every man, teaching every man, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 24. As we look further to Acts chapter 1, we also realize another very important and practical message. Now that Judas has hung himself, and there is a, uh, a place that needs to be filled among the twelve apostles, we learn that God, who's going to do the selecting here, He knew the heart of Matthias, and He still knows the hearts of men today. Notice Acts chapter 1, verse number 24 with me. The Bible records in Acts 1, verse 24, And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, notice this, who know the hearts of all, Show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship. And so the selection is left up to God because God knows the hearts of all men. Now, the immediate context, God knew who the right replacement was. The more practical application, God knows our hearts. John 2 verse 25, the Bible says it this way, Jesus knew what was within man. Friend, as I think about practical living. As I think about things that are very important, Luke 16 verse 15, God knows our heart. God knows your heart. Uh, we, we learn that God knows and sees all things. Proverbs 15 verse 3, the Bible said, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the good and the evil. All things are open and naked before the eyes of Him with whom we must give an account. And the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse number 14, that even the secret things, God knows them. Let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Solomon says, Fear God, keep His commandments. This is the whole duty of man. Why? For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. God knew the hearts of those two men there and chose who was necessary to fill that wonderful spot. But friend, God knows my heart. Practically speaking, I can't fool God. I cannot trick God. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked whatsoever man sows. That will he also reap. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 10. And so, if we're really honest with ourselves, we can't fool God and we know that. If we're living right and doing right and trying to walk in the light, friend, that's encouraging. God knows that and sees all things. But if we're not doing right, if we're not living like we ought to, then we need to realize God also knows that and we need to be concerned about those things as well. Another lesson that we learn is that in Acts chapter 2, as Peter stands up to preach the gospel, his sermon that he preaches for the very first time consisted of the core of the gospel, the death the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He shows that God had predetermined that, that the signs and wonders He did approved Jesus as the Son of God, that Jesus died for us, that He was buried, and that ultimately His soul was not left in the Hadean realm, and 
he rose up out of that grave, proving to fact he is the Son of God, the Messiah and the Savior of the world. This is why Peter then says in verse 36, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, because of these things, you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt, God has made this Jesus, the very one you just crucified, both Lord and Christ. Friend, as we think about the, the power of the gospel message, just as on Pentecost, so it is today. The power of that message is seen in the death, in the burial, and in the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Listen carefully. God so loved me, and He so loved you, that He sent His own Son to die for each one of us. The beautiful words of John 3.16 illustrate that so powerfully. God so loved the world, he gave, gave what? His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The, the love of Christ compels us, Paul would say, in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. God is love. 1 John 4, verse 8. All those verses so beautifully illustrate the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Yes, it is true that Jesus died. And there's no doubt that He was buried. But friend, the good news is, death, the Hadean realm, could not contain Him. Christians often sing the song, Up from the grave He arose. And friend, that's the powerful victory we have. He, Jesus, through death, overcame Him who had the power over death and has released those who all their lifetime were subject to bondage. Hebrews 2, verse 14. Oh, death, this is why Christians uh, can exult as Paul did. Oh, death, where is your sting? Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. Strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 55 through 57. Now, as we move further into the text of that great sermon in Acts chapter 2, as Peter helped them to see, you've just killed your own Messiah, they respond properly in verse 37. They cried out. that they were. The Bible says they were cut to the heart. The evidence was overwhelming. Their heart is now open and receptive. They're cut to the heart. And they cry out, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter's answer is so clear and so plain. He says, therefore, based on your question, based on the evidence, he says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to notice the things again that happened as we think about the great question, what must I do to be saved? These people hear the message of the gospel. And friend, for somebody to be saved, you've got to hear God's Word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10 verse 17. These people are, are cut to the heart, meaning that, that that message works on their heart and they're ready to repent. And Peter tells them to in Acts 2 verse 38. And friend, for a person to be saved, that heart has got to be opened and pricked by the Word of God today. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. They acknowledge the fact that Jesus is Lord and Savior. And friend, a person, if they're going to be saved, must confess Jesus as the Lord. And so they heard the Word of God. They believe Jesus is now the Christ. They're willing to repent and acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior. What else was necessary for these folks to have their sins forgiven. Listen again to Acts 2 verse 38. Peter said, Repent, notice the conjoining word, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Friend, a lot of people stop short when we come to what the Bible says on salvation. A lot of people say, yes, you've got to believe, repentance, confession, you've got to hear the Word of God, but they, they don't teach what the Bible teaches about baptism. Friend, listen carefully. The Scriptures teach. We're talking about opening God's Word and letting God speak today. The Scriptures teach 
that to be saved, not after you're saved, not two weeks later, that in order to be saved, to have your sins washed away, and to be right with God, a person must be baptized. Salvation does not occur before baptism. Acts 2 verse 38, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Now, some people get to this point and they say, well, that verse, uh, that word, those words for the remission really mean because of. Friend, that's not correct according to the New Testament. Let me give you an exact parallel. Matthew 26, verse 28. Jesus, as the institute of the Lord's Supper, said, This is my blood of the new covenant shed for many, here's the exact phrase, for the remission of sins. Now, same Greek syntax, same words, same structure. What does that mean in Matthew 26, 28? Did Jesus die because our sins were forgiven? No. Jesus died in order that to receive the end result of man's sins being forgiven. Same word structure in Acts 2 verse 38. Baptism is for the remission of sins. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. And so we want to stress today what the New Testament teaches about salvation. Another powerful principle that we learn from the book of Acts as we think about these messages is what happened to these people when they obeyed the gospel? The Bible teaches in Acts 2, verses about verses 38 through 46, they heard that word, they gladly received that word, and they were baptized. Those people who simply obeyed God's plan of salvation, what happened to them? Where were they put? Where did they end up being? The Bible says in Acts 2, verse 47, the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. What church? The church Jesus promised to build. Jesus said, I will build my church. Not a man-made institution. Not a denomination. Not something that came 600 or 1500 years later. They were added to the New Testament church. The church, the one church Jesus promised to build. The church of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so friend, when someone obeys the gospel, they're added to God's church. They're added to God's kingdom. And how important it is that we stress the Lord adds people. You're not voted in. Nobody decides on you. You're added to the Lord's church and we need to assemble with and worship the way that church did in the New Testament. Now, as we think further about these principles, Peter is going to preach in Acts chapter 3 that Jesus Himself is the Prince of Life, that He's the Savior of the world. Acts 3 verse 15, to the Jews in Solomon's portico, He drives that message home about Christ. And what did Peter tell them to do? Acts 3 verse 19, the Bible says these words. Peter re records, Repent therefore, the Holy Spirit records, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Here are people who haven't reached that point of changing their life and haven't really opened their heart to God's Word yet. And so Peter says, You need to repent and be converted so that your sins may be blotted out. Here we learn repentance is essential to salvation, and it's something God has commanded. Luke 3, verse 8, John said, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Luke 13, verse 3, John said, Brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. You know, repentance is not just... Here's the idea some people have about repentance. I feel sorry for it, therefore I repented. No, it's not just sorrow. Godly sorrow produces repentance, Second Corinthians 7, verse 10. But sorrow alone is not repentance. Repentance is a changed will that leads to a changed way. I change my way of thinking about something and I follow that up by changing my way of acting about that as well. And so, as we think about these lessons, Peter then and John then move into Acts chapter 4 as they're continuing to preach the gospel. Because of the man they healed in Acts chapter 3, they're now going to be questioned by the Jewish elite. And here's their question. By what power or by what authority have you done these things? Who gave you the power to heal that man? He'd been there all his life. Everybody knew him. Uh, he came to Peter and John, or Peter and John walked by, and he's he begging for alms. And Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And the man leaped and ran, and people were amazed. 
undeniable miracle. The Jews are upset. Who gave you that power? Jesus did. Acts 4 verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other. For there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Friend, our power and our authority. We're not claiming we can do miracles or things like that today. But our power comes and our authority comes from Almighty God. The Scripture says in Matthew 28 verse 18, All authority, Jesus spoke these words, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. If Jesus has all authority and the Word of God is the recorded message of the Gospel and the New Testament, then, friend, Christians' authority must be based on the Bible. Now, I want to drive this principle home. Men today don't have that authority. They cannot make religious laws. They cannot make laws to tell you what to be saved. They cannot make laws to forgive you. Only the Bible sets the standard and the guide for how to live. And so we need to start listening to the authority of Jesus and not let the messages of other people sway us. But now I want you to listen again to those powerful words in Acts 4 verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The precious, powerful name Authority of Jesus is the only name and authority by which men and women can be saved. Friend, that great question that was asked in Acts 2 verse 37, men and brethren, what shall we do? Is the question we pose to you today. Have you been saved? Have you obeyed the gospel? If not, won't you do the things that we read about and studied about today? Hear the message of Almighty God. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God and Savior of the world. Repent of those things in your life that are not right. Confess Him as Lord in Christ and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Just as on the day of Pentecost, we're encouraging you today Obey the gospel. Let the Lord add you to His church. Simply become a New Testament Christian. We hope that you'll continue to study with us as we think further about in our next lesson the wonderful messages of the book of Acts. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.